Welcome to another episode of the RAG podcast. And for those of you who don't know, the RAG stands for Recruitment Agency Growth. Since early 2019, I've been interviewing the most successful and innovative recruitment owners to learn how they rose to the top of their game. In season seven, I'm gonna be having raw, authentic, and insightful conversations with agency owners, entrepreneurs, leaders, people across the industry. And I wanna be learning about their ambitions, what's happening behind the scenes in their agencies today and their plans to navigate difficult market conditions. I'll be bringing you the latest and greatest recruitment stories every single week on Wednesdays at noon across multiple platforms. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the RAG podcast on this week's show. I'm doing things a little bit different as the, my guest is a guy called Mel Kang, the CEO of a company called Mezzle. Mezzle is actually a law firm. It's not a recruitment agency. It's what's called a consulting law firm a disruptive law firm that takes traditional lawyers who work for traditional law firms and flips the model. So they come in without a single salary, but take home 70% of their, their annual earnings, their billings. Um, the reason I bring in Mel on the show is because it is incredible how similar the law industry is to the recruitment industry. The way they set their firms up is almost identical. Mel has decided now that he runs Mezzle He's actually just a headhunter. His whole day job is headhunting lawyers from traditional firms and bringing them in. In two and a half years, he launched Mezzle on the first day of the pandemic when Boris Johnson announced the world, or the country was going into lockdown. He quit his job and he launched Mezzle with his, with his friend and business partner, Raj. In that time, they've now built to 48 consultant lawyers um, in the UK, 32 in the UK, and I think 16 or so in Dubai. Um, and they are on track to become one of the biggest top 200 law firms in the world. Um, but the reason I'm featuring the show is one, he's a headhunter. That's all he does. And the way he describes it is exactly the same. But I believe there's so much you can learn as a recruitment founder, as a recruitment, as a recruiter um, from Mel and the way that he thinks um, to adapt and evolve and, and make your recruitment company better. So take notes. I hope you enjoy this one as much as I did. Without further ado, Mel, welcome to the RAG podcast. Morning, Sean. Welcome. You're welcoming me to my own show. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> slight spin, slight, slight spin, Sean. Slight spin, Sean. Slight Sorry. Spin. Mel, Mel, what a, what a pleasure to have you on, on the show. We know each other pretty well now, having worked together for about three, four months. Um, and uh, we did. I've been excited for this one. It's, uh, it's slightly different. So, Mel, people don't know you. I've done a brief introduction. Well, give us the bird's eye view of, of you and Mezzel. I don't want the story. Just if someone was like, what is Mezzel? And what do you do on a you know in a 30 second elevator pitch? And then we'll go back and tell the story. Um, we are and look like a law firm. Yeah. Uh, we are a fee share consultant law firm based in London. Um, but we operate and I'm sure what we'll delve into a bit later, we operate like a um, executive search headhunting firm. Yeah, Recruitment. So it's crazy. And, and how many people have you got now? We've got 36 lawyers in the UK and we are now up to 12 in Dubai. Wow. So 48 practicing lawyers in how long? How long have you been going? Two and a half years. Two and a half years. That's mega. That's really quick. Yeah. Um, and what kind of revenue, top line revenue, would that would those people bring into Mezzle? Obviously, we'll talk about the model, but top line revenue. Um, we in our second year now, we are going to be surpassing one point five mil, and at the end of next year, uh, we sh will be up to close to just over three. It's yeah. exciting. Super exciting. So. Let's tell a story. Like if I look at, like I say, most people who come into this show are recruitment owners, traditional recruiters. They've run a recruitment business for somebody else and then they start their own. You know, that was kind of my journey until I went on a different path. You've not done that. So let's work out what you've done. Uh, Is that an alarm going off with your... <laughs> no, no, it's, 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 it's the Friday... The the 10 a.m. We work fire we alarm, work. guys. Yeah. This is what remote podcasting does to people. So, when did you, when did you get into law? Like, what's the story there? 
Um, story of law. I fell into it completely by chance, by accident. I didn't. This is probably going to shock some of the viewers there who don't who don't know me. I never wanted to be a lawyer. I just yeah. despised the industry. Um, I'm I'm a bit of a sporty guy, and I'm a, I love tennis. Tennis is one of one sport. I always dreamed to become a tennis pro. Um, I just didn't make it. I just uh, I went to a I went to a tournament. I've just failed miserably. Uh, my dad pretty much beat me up in the car on the way back from Gateshead. Um, and that's a long drive. That's a long drive back in sort of 1997. My dad's uh, Volkswagen Jetta that he had. So people know what that, that car is. And um, he just said, um, and coming from like an Indian sort of background culture, uh, we're pushed to, to do, uh, be professionals and academics. And my dad said, I've got, you know, I've got, I've got doctors and dentists in the family. I want a lawyer. So my dad basically forced me to go to uh, go to law school. I had to go through clearing. I don't even know where I was going. I just sort of randomly picked a university and I ended up and just, I was forced to do, just to do law. So uh, where I, studied, did you end up I went to a university called uh, Staffordshire University. Um, mm. maybe, Sort of, yeah, it was, it was good. It was good. I, had to, I, I, to be honest, I actually had some good times there. It was a good, good law school. Um, yeah, I got the qualifications, I did the LPC, uh, got a training contract, and got into, did some good interviews, got into a couple of good firms. And I, as, uh, it was, yeah, I always kind of, like, it was never a passion of mine. Um, and I think what I realized, what I realized now, sorry, after sort of nearly being 20 years qualified. I realized that I wasn't fit for the traditional model. And what I got into now, which is the Mesel model, which is the fee share consultant model, I fell in love with law. I, I've i obsessed with it. Um, I'm probably the oldest consultant lawyer in the country, oldest by experience, not age. And I've been doing it nearly, nearly 14 years straight. And uh, it's 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 breathtaking. It's given me it's given me the life that I want to live. It's given me it's allowed me ability to be a tennis pro and play three four times a week. I'm not a tennis pro, sorry, but pretend to be a tennis pro. Yeah. I get to see my family, get to see my three children, get to spend more time with the wife. My earnings were more than equity partners from traditional law firms um and laws you know it's such a dinosaur that it just ha hasn't evolved and this new model has allowed um lawyers to live and work in a different space so can um, we just break that down because i don't think people will know what you're on about right it, it sounds great but so you're working for a traditional law firm on a salary being paid a bonus, I imagine, annually or, yeah, yeah, yeah. or whatever. What was it, what was it like? Well, sometimes not. Uh, yeah, so what was the, typical... just, what's the job actually like? Because people, you know, there's quite a glamorous look on law. You know, you at shows like Suits and there's loads of like legal TV shows where it looks really glamorous. What's it yeah. really like as a junior lawyer or whatever? Um, those, those, you know, suits, those videos, I'm pretty sure the legal fraternity might agree. Yeah, it, it does look like that. Uh, but you know, you you're in suits, you're in ties. Everyone's looking smart, and that's that's just a byproduct of of legal services, professional services. Um, those traditional firms, you know, they're always in the city centre locations, big offices, yeah. big floors, etc. Um, the model is typically um, they pay you a salary, and you've got to generate three times that your salary. And just if, like recruitment. Just like recruitment, yeah. So if, you know, if, for example, if, you know, if my salary is 50,000 pounds, then I've got to generate 150,000 for the okay. firm. Yeah, so typically that free, that-, that How do you components. generate that? How do you generate that? Well, starting as a junior lawyer up until sort of mid-level lawyer, the firm just provides you with the work. They give you the instructions and it's just filtered down to you. And that's, you just got to your service billable, it. Your billable time needs to equate to three times what they're paying you for you to be worthwhile. Yeah. And if you want a pay rise, if you want to have that conversation at the end of the year, pay rise, well, you know what's going to happen. I want an extra five, 10 grand. They're going to say, well, can we have an extra 50 grand on top? So yeah, you can it's see it's just, yeah, it's, it's just, it's just, and what are you actually doing? Is it a lot of it just reading documentation? Is it very like head down? Yeah, you read, well, you read, read documents, you draft documents, draft documents, uh, you amend documents, you tell the clients, you basically got to put it in really simple, easy to stand, understand language for the client, because the, what, what you forget is what the lawyer sometimes forget is the document is the client's document, it's not the lawyer's document, we just draft it, they've got to understand what they're signing, apart from Sean, you're probably, I'm sure you're speaking to your lawyers, all you clients tend to sometimes look at is really is the, the name, address, and then the price. 
to make sure those bits those bits are right, but they won't look at any other clause. Well, I've 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 recently rejigged all my terms and conditions, and also done a shareholders agree and a new shareholders agreement with Amma. And honestly, like it's mind blowing shit half of it. Like it goes straight over my head. I know what I need to read and I understand yeah. it, but it, it's still not layman's terms. I don't care what you say. Like there's there's a lot of jargon in there. But I imagine reading that all day would send my head and to another level. I would not enjoy a minute of it. Did you enjoy that stuff? Um, I did, yeah, I did, I did. I, I think I enjoy the bits where the bit where you're saying you didn't understand it, that would really bug me. I'd make sure my clients understood a lot of the, I mean, they're, they're, supposed to, they're supposed to understand every part of the contract, but you're right, in reality, they probably won't. And they want to just understand how much am I getting from this deal? Is my address correct? And what are these key terms at the bottom belt? Can you explain those? As long as they got those points, it was- What type of law were you doing? I did corporate healthcare. So uh, I'm sure you go to a dentist, doctors, pharmacists, care, and care home operators. I used to buy and sell their businesses. Oh, wow. So you're doing like M&A M &A yeah. transactions? Corp M and A type corporate transactions if for the healthcare community. Anything white coats, right. I would buy and sell. So it was, it was, it's a really good area to be in. Not too many lawyers in there. So it's always, when we're doing deals, always the same names are always cropping up. Uh, good lawyers. And um, it, was, it was also a good sector to be in because it was almost recession proof. In a recession, everybody still needs a doctor, dentist, pharmacist, care homes still operating. So it was, I mean, during lockdown, I probably had my financially, my best years, income wise, it was just uh, crazy. When, let's break that down, what you said before then. So when did you discover consulting law and what is it? So in 2000 and nine during the financial crash um, I got made redundant by my current firm there um, and yeah, it was it was a bit of a it was a sort of it was a saddening experience I've just never felt that before um, yeah. and told to just you know pack your stuff and go nothing no the firm did nothing wrong so I understand why why they did it I think when I went home that day I drove back and I was working in Leicester at the time I was going down the M69 and I was just uh, it was a bit teary and I thought, what am I doing next? And I, I've got a bit of an entrepreneurial sort of mindset. And I thought, Do you know what? I'm going to go get my own law firm and um, I'm going to go set it up and da, da, da. And only the very next day, I got basically, I got a call from a from another firm when I'd done a deal with them. Uh, I was in a transaction, sorry. And um, they knew I was no longer part of the firm. And they just said to me, look, come have a conversation um, and tomorrow, have a coffee. And we just started talking. And from that one conversation, a couple of weeks later, we uh, they just said to me, look, um, I, I told them I'm about to set up my own law firm and they put me off. I said, don't, don't do it. It's management, it's banking. You've got to be a cult coffer. This is what lawyers will recognize. They're like um, compliance officers and that. Plus you're going to have to be the, the BD person and then on top of that, you've got to be the lawyer that's got to do the work. So I did scratch my head. I think, oh, Jesus, this, 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 this sounds too intense for me at this stage. And plus my tennis career, I was obviously I'm still in my head. I'm still thinking I'm going, I'm going to become a tennis pro. And that's and that childish sometimes. How old are you at this point? And, uh, I was 30, I was saying 32. Yes, that's quite old to still want to make it in tennis. Yeah, 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 of course it is. Yeah, yeah. And I had a lot of, Ian Wright of tennis. <laughs> yeah, I still think I'm, I still thought to myself, I'm, I still want my lifestyle. I still want to be able to go to the gym. I still want to be able to see a lot of my family. Obviously, I was married then. I had, I had the one baby. I had a, I had a mortgage. You know, I was paying eight hundred. I remember it says eight hundred eighty-eight pounds. I remember it's triple eight, and uh, I was paying it to NatWest. And I thought that's my monthly mortgage, and I haven't got no income at the moment. We've had a little bit of savings, and this firm just approached, floated the idea of me becoming a consultant lawyer. And I didn't, I didn't know what it, what, it, what, it, what, it, what even a consultant lawyer meant or, or, or what it did. All I understood was from that meeting was that I didn't have a salary. All right, tick, I got that bit. I didn't have to constantly work at the same place. Okay, tick, I got that. And then the other bit was I, I didn't actually have, I didn't have to report into anybody. I could just be my own boss effectively. So I kind of got a bit of a tick, tick, tick. And then, um, and then the fee shares bit, because there's no, no salary here, I was given a 70-30 fee share split, 70-30%. That's, that's typically how it's all done. Um, so you came in, start... you'd come in salary-free, like a, almost like you're self-employed, 
but yeah. they and you would take home 70 percent of everything you bill everything you bring in they get 30 percent. but they provide the infrastructure the brand do they provide the clients as well at that stage or not uh no they don't no clients they give me no referral i oh, sorry they don't no referrals they, they do give you referrals they don't give you a client sorry that's what i'm trying to say they give you pi insurance they give you a little desk you can use an office space etc you can be on the website and you can be part of their brand yeah you, you yeah get, so you you're basically that. starting your own firm without starting yeah. your own firm with the backing of a brand and other other lawyers and you look a different level than being mel kang law and on day one right? yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. So exactly, I've got like I've got a bit of a yeah, I've got, I've got a bit more of a structure. I'm a I'm a business within a business. Yeah, it's probably a better way of describing it. And, 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 and we like, said this. I spoke to you offline. There's you know there's a couple of recruitment firms out there running very similarly. Like I, I did an interview with a guy called Robin Dernicker in in in, in Japan, who runs yeah. a firm called Zensho, which is yeah almost identical. It's a consulting recruitment firm really because people come in salary free, take seventy percent. Um, I did a did an episode in the pandemic with him. There's not many of yeah. them, to be fair, but it's definitely a, a model I think could work in in recruitment. So, what was it like doing that and not well, taking that plunge? Obviously, you still got the mortgage. You're not given any business development support. What, how did you oh. get on? Oh, it was tough, really tough. I mean, I'm I don't know, I'm a very transparent kind of guy. People people that know me, and it's not for the faint hearted. I'm not trying to sort of put people off here, but I did it when I did it back then. I was a lot younger. Nobody knew about knew too much about the model. Um, I was lawyers that we speak to and we sort of recruit. They're all the starting point is typically they're over ten years qualified. I was only six year five to six years qualified. So I'm pretty much going against the grain of what I did <laughs> and with who we speak to now here at Mesel. And um, it was it was tough because I didn't know. Well, what I always say, Sean, is lawyers are good at the law, obviously, because we're taught the law. Lawyers are just bad, very bad at business development, marketing, sales, and how to close clients. You're not given that training at a traditional firm. I don't care what anyone tells you. They can say we're going for business development, but that just typically means you're just going to a bar with a couple of your clients and you're having a couple of drinks. They don't sit you down and tell you about and teach you, yeah, because that's what I've learned about headhunting is it, the, the key to it is always listening. And when I realized, I thought, well, I had the mortgage bills, I had the, this bill, I had that bill. I'm not a flashy kind of guy. And I, I had a, I remember having a, a golf um, and uh, it's just a clatter at golf and a car. And it's worth two and a half grand, but it was good. It just kept me sort of stable. And I realized that I thought, I can, I can do the work. I, I know exactly what I'm doing. I'm good at, good at the work, but I just can't find the clients. So I just basically, I taught myself marketing and sales and business development, how to close clients. I just did read books. I went on YouTube, I went on some courses and I probably spent the probably six months to eight months of making so many mistakes of what I thought how to win clients. Did you, did you make enough money just to break even and survive for I, that period? I, I, I think, I'll tell you exactly how much I made. I made 58,000 pounds. In the first I year? Made in the first year, yeah. I remember it. What were you earning the year before at the law firm? Um, no, I sorry, I, I turned over 58,000 for revenue, yeah. so I was only getting just below, I was getting below even half of that, yeah. So I was getting about 22 odd thousand pounds. I remember that bad for the first year, and then what happened after I tr upskilled myself, trained myself, made all mistakes, learned about, had read loads of books on. On marketing and sales, I uh, the next year I doubled. I went up to a hundred, and then the third year that was pretty much like a hockey stick. It just shot up. I went to like one eighty, and then every year after that, I was typically billing about five six hundred. I'm interrupting today's episode to give you a message from our brand new sponsor. Now this company are called Untapped, and everyone knows that Hoxo. Through this podcast, I've, I've explained that we, we've built our team internationally, heavily in South Africa, okay? And I get questions all the time from clients and people who listen to the show, like, how have you done it? What was the process, etc. Well, I've partnered with a business that can ultimately reveal it all, share it all, and, and help you do the same, right? Because look, it's been a tricky year for the sector, and many of people through uncertain times have had to streamline operations. However, you know, accessing low cost resources internationally has proven to be a bit of a cheat code for some people, including Hoxo. But anyone who's tried it, like us, it's very difficult, a lot of work, process to get it right. So this company, Untapped, are one of the hottest companies in the market. They've helped Hoxo, they're helping our clients. 
Um, and they specifically look at companies in the UK, US, Middle East and Australia transition to using remote individuals and building full offshore sourcing and recruitment solutions. So they source talent pools from places like South Africa and the Philippines. Um, and we're talking about experienced talent here. We're not talking about graduates with no experience. This is like people with three to five years recruitment experience and integrate them into your UK team, okay? So they work remotely, but plug into your UK team. Um, they put around 3,000 candidates per month through an intense four-stage interview and online testing process to find the top 1% or 30 people and secure these people for work with recruitment agencies like yourself. You know, all candidates are benchmarked against UK competency frameworks and the, the way in which you would hire in the UK. So we're not, again, we're not talking about cheap for the sake of being cheap. We're talking about international experienced people just living in lower cost locations. So it's a really simple process. If you want to work with these guys, you pay a deposit to kick off their search. They then provide a candidate shortlist in 14 days. And then you can put people through your own process to hire them permanently, or there's a freelance option. So if you just want to try before you buy, they can employ them. You pay a daily rate and it's a freelance option. Untapped are totally transparent with all the salaries and fees. Um, but, you know, we're talking about, you'll still pay about 70% less than a UK equivalent in that role. So it's a no brainer to complement your existing team to handle surplus demand and ease cost pressures. You know, if you're not using this to rip up your business and rebuild it with global resources, then you're probably gonna fall behind eventually. So due to demand and capacity, they're only operating on a waiting list right now. So if you wanna be part of their waiting list, go to www.tryuntapped.com. Okay, www.tryuntapped.com and check out their information. Make sure you say that you listen to the RAG podcast um, because they'll do you a very special deal as well. Right, go and check them out. Back to the show. Yeah, which is pretty impressive numbers, right? Pretty yeah, good life. Of course it is. Yeah, oh, um, change, change, change the lifestyle completely. But, but like you said, it was not It was working in a way that then also really suited you. So paint a picture for people. Like, what was your, like, how did you actually operate? Where did you base yourself? What were your hours like? How did you run it? So I still went into an office. The, the firm that I went to was just a typical traditional firm, okay? That just housed a few consultant lawyers in the firm, okay? Um, now, looking back at it, that's not the right firm to go to. If you want to do what I'm describing here, if you want to be a fee share lawyer where you can keep 70% of your earnings and you want to work with freedom and flexibility, well, go to a proper fee share consultant law firm. Don't go to, do not go to a traditional with who have some consultants or don't even try to go to a hybrid, a bit hybrid type firm because the culture and the way it's designed is still really geared around traditional lawyers. But the way I was operating, I, Monday to Friday, I worked where I wanted. Nobody asked me if I didn't come in on Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday. Yeah. Um, yes, I had a bit of support here and there, etc. Secretarial PA type, it still wasn't essential. Um, you need good IT infrastructure and it's got to be designed for the consultant model, the, the IT infrastructure. If it's only designed to be for a traditional firm, it's, a bit, it's just a bit clunky. It's like square peg, round hole type scenario going on. Um, it, takes one of the one of the biggest bits of advice i give to anybody coming into our model is that i always say make sure you put aside three months of expenses assume assuming you make no money for three months you've got your household and your bills covered before you even get take go over the line and come over and join um us so um so those first few years were first first 15, 16 months were a bit scary. Were, were you going into, but were you spending your time working like you do it before? Did you did you start working from the tennis club and you were you were you were totally wearing your you know track suits and did you start <laughs> to work a certain way that you wanted or did you did you kind of traditionally yeah, work? Yeah. No, I still I still went in dressed like in this the, yeah. the shirt and the tie yeah for the first probably couple of months. I then realised that I just didn't need to dress like everybody else. So it slowly turned into the jeans and the t-shirt and the jumpers. And then it just went to straight, oh, got tennis later. So I just went to my shorts, my jacket, et cetera. I did look a bit odd, but I just said to, I said to the partners, I said, well, me dressed as a typical lawyer in a suit and me dressed in my tennis gear, doesn't mean the advice I give is going to be any better or worse. And they went, no, right. fair point. <laughs> and I said, I don't have to be here till five o'clock, 5.30. I'm going to leave at one o'clock because I'm playing tennis down at the local club for a couple of hours. And my clients are going to speak to them this evening. 
and it, it almost I always sense the point of jealousy as well because people thought God, you've got so much flexibility. But then I would say turn around and say, well, you've got a fixed income. Yeah, you got guaranteed income. Again, you're working in that almost hybrid or, or or a business that was leaning more to the traditional model. So when did you didn't you then take a move to a full consulting law firm? I did. I did. That was probably one of the funniest uh, uh, moves ever that I ever did. Um, and it's something what you said about five minutes ago, if, if the listeners want to re- sort of rewind back, you said about the 70-30 fee share split. Um, I went to um, a firm called Gunner Cook. People can yeah. see my profile. It's one of the biggest consultant law firms out there. I had had a great time there. I had a really, really great time there. And one of the owners there, Sarah, she's the one who recruited me. And she was always sending me to, you know, come, come over. Uh, she must have met me about two or three times trying to convince me to come over. And she kept telling me it's 70 first. I mean, I was actually blown away that there was such a firm, such a thing as a law firm that was designed purely for fee sharing consultant lawyers. I couldn't believe that such a firm existed. And I was I was really sort of wowed by it all. And I thought, wow, it's the, 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 the landscape's changing and law is now evolving. Brilliant. I was really excited about it. And I... When I was with Sarah, we were, I remember being at the train station and uh, she was convincing me to join. And uh, I just said, financially, it just makes no sense because I'm just going to be earning the same money. You've got the infrastructure there. She's telling me about the IT and this and the other. And I thought, okay, that's a bit of a tick. But I've just got, it's working for me now. I've just turned everything. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about what I did sort of five, six years ago when I joined the, the little sort of boutique firm. Um, and I turned everything around on my own. And I just felt there was a real sense that I thought it's working for me. It's getting better for me. Do I really need to make the move? And then as I explained to Sarah, um, she just said to me, I said to her, look, financially, I just don't, I don't benefit from this. And then she said to me, (laughs) she goes to me, she goes, well, how are you going to probably build this year? And I said, well, um, so far I've probably built 300,000. And uh, she goes, oh, three, that's really good. Well, you know, probably just halfway through the year. You know, you've taken home nearly sort of just over 200 grand. And I was like, uh, 200 grand? I said, not no. I said, I've taken about 90, 80, 90 grand. And uh, she was like, no. She was like... You were on less than 50% with that first one. So, so, no, no. So what happened, so when we talked about 70, 30, the first firm I was with, I was on 30% and they were taking 70%. Are you joking? With no <laughs> and, <laughs> No salary. Yeah. I went up, when I sat there with what would you with Sarah, so just to just to stop there. So if you would have gone in on a salary, what percentage would you would you get no percent? Like what how would you be bonused and paid? Like bonuses you typically I mean I think bonuses are sort of pittance really. I don't think I think the biggest bonus I've ever got paid on a salary is about five grand. But if you put it comparatively, I should have been on a salary of and of a salary of about um probably forty thousand. 40,000 was my market salary. And in the first year, I remember I did about 22, I, I took home 22,000 pounds, took half what I could have generated on salary. So that, that was risky. Fast forward next year, and I've, I've surpassed my 40,000 salary. I think I was up to about, what was it, about 60,000. 60, and then next year, I'm now at 180, and I'm basically touching. So you did 180, back. only earning 30%? Yeah. So no, no, sorry, sorry. sorry. No, sorry. I build one eighty, but I took, only took thirty percent of one eighty. So that's sixty. Yeah. yeah. What's the most you took at only turning at only earning thirty percent? A hundred. Yeah. I've got, so I got, I got, I got, I got to six figures. So when I'm stood, when I sat in that that's meeting, incredible, then, isn't it? Just, just yeah. you're doing six. Yeah. yeah, that's really good. And, and sat in that meeting um, when when Sarah turns around to me and says, "You got your math wrong," and I say, "No, you've got your math wrong." We had a five. We had a we had a five second sort of pause, and then the penny dropped, and she was yeah, like, Are "I'll, you I'll t- take the job." Like, <laughs> like, when, take, when, it's like that moment in the wall. Have you seen the Wall Street when uh, Jonah Hill turns around to Leonardo DiCaprio, and he's like, was, "Have you seen him? He's in the cafe, and he's right. He's looking at his check. He's just got his check through, and he's like, "You made that in one month," and he goes, "Yep." He goes, and he says like. If, they, if you're telling me the truth, I quit my fucking job and I come and work for you right now. Like, it's like he's like, he has a light moment, like, I'm in the wrong game. And it sounds like you had the same moment. I think for me, the, the criminal plot, I've seen the film, I can't recall the scene, but what I, what I always did was when I hit that 100 grand and I saw the sort of money coming to a bank account, you know, we, we've all got, we've all got the bank uh, apps on our phones. 
and you know seeing that money land into your bank account it was it was yeah it was weird you still needed to pay tax on it didn't you you sold yeah so yeah so you didn't actually get 100 grand because then you're paying tax and all of it so yeah but it was it was but it's still more it's still more than my salary is what it was and and i did it i did it earning i earned that by doing less hours that's the other bit that didn't hit me and then i just thought to myself i said what am i you know and and then seeing that offer of 70 for 70 to me, 30 to the firm. And that's how the market is generally paid for, for consultant lawyers. I uh, just blew, it just blew my mind. Yeah. I was literally, it's the same thing. I went home, spoke to the wife and I just said, she goes, are you crazy? She goes, why didn't you ask this question? I said, well, it was just, we just we thought we were on the same page. I didn't know. And I just couldn't wait to sign the contract. It was absolutely. Could you take, it. see the difference in law as well is like what happens to your current clients and all the work, all the relationships. Cause in recruitment, obviously you move across. And you have a non-compete for six or twelve months or whatever the contract was. That there's a period of time you can't you can't work with people you've been working with. And what what's the deal when you move to going to cook from the first firm? How does that work? Um, for you? As 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 in a traditional law firm environment, the clients belong to the firm, and there are those restrictive covenants. And it's just it's just it's just a time lag. So they'll yeah. typically have six months. They have some 12 months, but it's typically six months. What I say to anybody is, well, six months, it will just fly by. You'll, you'll yeah. fly, you'll, you'll, you'll take two months just settling in. Then you've just got four yeah. months. They'll just be really be sort of gearing up. Then you can go back and then speak to your clients. That's your yeah. outside the covenant period. In the fee share model, in our consultant model, um, clients are yours. Yeah. So as yeah. soon as I handed my notice in, yeah, that's why clients, uh, spoke to all my clients, they said, well, no one here, I don't know anybody in, in the rail center firm, to be honest, Mel, you're my guy, um, I'm, I'm coming with you, give me the new details. And I had, I had something like 48, I remember 48 clients and 47 went across on well, one stayed behind. I'm happy to. The thing, is, the thing about your clients as well is it is probably a little bit more stable than a recruitment consultants clients because they can be quiet that they're getting hammered by it's not like you just have one recruiter and you just stick to them a lot of people will have multiple and it's every role you might actually move out to different people because they're slightly different and whereas law you, you kind of once you get a lawyer that you believe in and you kind of stick with them don't you so you can you, and were they paying you like a retainer as well or was it all no 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 i mean you know, sure recruitment and the law i don't know i've learned over the last couple of years really over the overlap it's so similar it's scary um the client no the, I, I kind of disagree clients right. um clients are ta- are sort of tapped up by other law firms and agents they start saying you know try this lawyer he's cheaper or let's try this lawyer he might be a bit more expensive but he gets things done quicker etc yeah. so yeah you you can you can lose clients very very quickly yeah uh, okay. it's not we don't have we don't so, some clients some law firms do have retainers and the type of work that I've done, um, transactional type work, clients pretty, pretty much come to you if they're buying, selling, or if they're in trouble. That's <laughs> that's that's typically the only reason they'll they'll they will instruct uh, yeah. you or, or me. Okay, so you move over to going to go. I want to get to Mezzle as soon as we can now because we, we I think so. How okay. long how long of working in, and taking home seventy percent did you realize you were going to do this for yourself and why? Um, so I was there for about five, six years, um, like I said, really excelled my practice, really grew the practice, really enjoyed it. I understood, I understood the model more as well. I got it, I understood yeah. what was going on. Um, and um, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you about the Google analogy afterwards as well, what, what happened with Mezzle. But I think the light bulb moment, Sean, was on the 23rd of March, 2020, because that was the day Boris Johnson told the whole of the country, said, people, we've got a horrible virus, work from home, stay at home. I literally sat in my kitchen, I sat there, I'm married to a traditional lawyer, by the way, and she was like scurrying around and saying, oh, what's, what's gonna happen, what's, what's, what are you doing? And I just sat there and I just, there was like a, there was like a storm going around the house, you know, it's, it's crazy, you know, take, imagine, the, you, yeah, you only see in the films, the prime minister, the leader of your country telling you to stay at home, don't go outside. And everyone's probably on the phone, was texting everything, and we're going, "What the fuck is going on?" And I just, I just, I just sat, stood, sat there, and I just thought, "Hang on a minute, I've just realised something." I thought every single lawyer in the country is going to experience the consultant model because we work, we predominantly work from home. They're going to experience it. This, it's been forced upon them, and I'm going to hedge a bet here. I'm going to hedge a bet, 
and realize that they're going to enjoy it. They're going to like it. And there's nothing that the employers can do about it because it's the same government. thing. The same thing has happened in recruitment, like the exact same thing. Yeah. You went from flexibility in recruitment firms being, you know, I don't know, you could wear a fucking polo shirt on a Friday. <laughs> that yeah. was probably about as flexible as the industry was. I remember trying to get people on Zoom calls in 2019 and they were like, nah. Yeah. And it was so like, I, now, like, fast forward, the industry just transformed and, and we have still got this aftermath now. I don't know about law where recruitment firms are trying to drag recruiters back to the office, mainly mm. so that they educate and support the younger generation coming through. So you've got all these associates coming in who are green and you've got all these 28 to 35 year old senior consultants, managing consultants that have got a great business book and know what they're doing. But when they're at home, they're not training the new blood. So, but then if I'm 32 and I've got two young kids and I'm loving working from home and I'm still making as much, if not more than I was before, why the fuck do I want to go back to the office? So yeah. You've got, this, you've got this problem now and it's all over the industry where yeah. people are like, are either being forced back or they're and begrudgingly doing it or they're just leaving and setting up their own or whatever. Like there's been 2,000 more recruitment firms started in the UK between January and July is 2023 than the year before. Yeah. 100% well, driven by that problem. Yeah. It, it, it's great. And it's been a great problem. And for us, it's been a huge catalyst. <laughs> I, 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 I love it. Because... It was a great problem. That's the, that's the headline on this. So do not, we're not going to go. <laughs> but it was, a, I think it was a huge eye opener. It, 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 told, it told me that this is your moment and this is the time to create Mezzle. So whilst everybody was up in arms about what was going on, I knew, I knew, look, we've got a great, we got really intelligent people on this planet, and they thought the scientists are going to come up with something. There's going to be a, there's going to be a, uh, there's going to be a um, antidote that they're going to bring out to fix all this. You know, I was thinking I'm a real believer in sci-fi, and I thought they'll they'll fix it, or they'll, they'll sort it all out. But then my plan, my whole hash about Mezzle and what I wanted to do, it was literally the next day. I spent that whole evening just sat there thinking, you know, in my head, <sighs> I've got to hand my notes in. I've got to transfer clients. You I've did got to that get, in. At the beginning of 2020, then, yeah, 2020 March, so it's not 21st, so it must be the next day, the 24th. I, I, I pretty much kind of stopped what I was doing for like for client work for that for that morning and got my whiteboard out. And they said the best designs and ideas are built in sheds and garages, and like Apple and uh, Microsoft, etc. I literally just did the same, but I just went to my shabby old little office uh, in the town center. I've got a whiteboard and I just just doodled, I did just brainstormed, I just put everything I could think of about a law firm onto a board. And uh, I called my, there's only one person I would ever go into business with, uh, except for law firm. And it was the guy that you now I like, qualified and trained over Raj. And uh, I just called him up. He's a traditional lawyer, next in line for equity. Um, and it was quite a scary conversation. I said, I've got to see you and you've got to come down tomorrow. And uh, you and Raj think, are like me and Amma. We've discovered this, haven't we? Like it's the yeah, same yeah. Sort of relationship. You're the brain, you're the, you're the big thinker. You're the, you're the ideas man. And he's the guy who probably makes sure it, it happens. Like Amma does with me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, yeah. I have a million ideas a day and he's like, there's usually a good yeah. one in there somewhere. Um, but without him, I wouldn't, I wouldn't execute well. And I think you've, you've got a similar background. So this is big. You're taking a plunge on the day the world's going into the biggest, the biggest potential downturn ever without any any knowledge of how long it's going to last. The only thing you probably believed in, I imagine, is that lawyers are going to still be required. It's not like you can't turn, you know, yeah. you're not going to turn your law, especially when the world's going into shit. Companies are like, we need a lawyer. Like, everyone needs a lawyer to check our contracts, ensure we can hold customers. There's always winners and losers and there's always law. So that wasn't going anywhere. And then you convinced Raj to quit as well or did he stay where he was? No, no, quit. I, I could not do it on my own. And you know it. You you know me now. And yeah, I've I, I'm I'm I've got I'm the, I'm the creator. I probably call. I can think it through. And I can map it out. But I have absolutely zero ability to execute. I'm not an ops person. No. Um, I'll be I'll be honest, Sean. I can tell the viewers happily. I'm not a great great manager of people at all. Um, I'm just I'm 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 guilty of expecting others to be up to speed exactly where I am. I'm not. I don't appreciate sometimes they you know they just got to go through a few more steps. Um, I'm just as bad as that. Yeah, it's it's, it's really annoying. But Raj, yeah, he can he can manage a team of hundred people. He's just I don't know how he, that's just his superpower. 
um and we just got together and he's he's very risk averse he's a, he's a litigator by law by by, by trade as well and they're a bit they're, they're a nightmare risk averse type people they are probably the worst so obviously he's come back with well have you thought about this and have you done this and have you done that and have you done this and, and pretty much it was on the board i said if i haven't well tell me and if i'm missing it we can piece it all together yeah. and then i think we spent that whole we spent a whole day and we we hadn't even eaten anything and we had probably was a, in the morning was just a a piece of toast or something and a cup of tea and we got to like six seven o'clock and i think i just blew his brain away and he just thought i'm sold and he gets my number the biggest hurdle he had though he had to go home and tell his wife <laughs> and i bet he's earning a considerable salary and yeah, yeah yeah i think the biggest thing was it wasn't even the money even though he was on six figure salary the biggest thing for him i think which which his partner his wife bought into was um uh, more time with the kids he, he can now do the school drop off school pickups she's working full time and he could just um, give a few more hours in the day, et cetera, work from home. They got so much more than he was, he just bought a property as well. And I think he was refurbishing it. So now all of a sudden he just realized, well, the downside is I've got no steady income coming in, but I've got enough savings and I can be at home to manage stuff. My wife is still working. And we were also, I think the model was quite receptive because don't forget, you're talking to lawyers now who we're approaching potentially and asking sort of, you know, what do you think? And they were like, I don't really want to go back to a, to an office yeah. environment I, yeah. I'm because they were doing exactly what we're doing home with the kids can go to the gym play tennis well the gym know. was shut wasn't it at that early days it was, oh yeah Talking, it was, yeah after because i had the same i was literally living in london with my ex and my dog and i was like i realized really fucking quick i liked it i liked the mm. i didn't like her and that's what we used to <laughs> but i liked i liked waking up and not having that pressure to get on the tube and get to work just to be in a fucking room to do the same thing I could do at home like that I realized really quick this is way more suited to me I also realized I don't want to see people all the time like I like being on zoom and then I like a 15 minute coffee to myself to recalibrate and then I jump on another one I don't actually want to be peppered by people and questions all the time like it's mm. but I also love meeting people now I love when I get out I appreciate seeing people first face to face like it really suited me and there's people who fucking hated every minute of it and are desperate to get back to the office and they've done that I, mm. I, I wasn't one of them so how, talk us through the journey then so where did the name Mezzle come from because it's such a cool innovative word a bit like Hoxo it means it doesn't mean anything I don't think like what what is it yeah it's uh I've I, I always thought the design, I thought if you're building something, you can't sound like everybody else. You've got to be different and look different. So I could have, you know, we called it Kang and Samal and Co and Bray and Co, et cetera, all, all the, uh, the partners of the firm, the owners of the firm, sorry. Um, it just, it's just traditional. You just, you're just like everybody else. And if you're going to research somebody or look up something, where's the first place you go to look? Sean, where'd you go? Where would you go? Thank you. You go to Google, you go to Google. Google is probably the best one of the beer the best companies on the planet, the best probably website I've ever come across. And I realized that when Google tries to find something, you know, it's called indexing, um, it tries to look at similar names or the names and it pulls it up. But I thought the best way to do a bit of marketing and to get headlines and, you know, to get accelerate and people to find you is to have a name that doesn't already exist. And I thought, exactly okay. I did. Yeah. Exactly. And I thought, exactly. So I thought, and then the bit I couldn't struggle with, obviously I'm trying to think of all these names. I couldn't think of anything. And I just, I, re I remember someone always telling me, if you want to do something new, then you've got to ask the mind of an innocent child. So, sorry, innocent person, sorry, not child. So the innocent person is a child because they're, they're basically not, they've not been exposed to, you know, war, sex, drugs, crime, that kind of stuff, or they do not experience all of life, but they can just, and they do not heard all of the words. So I literally turned down to my six-year-old daughter at the time. I said, darling, I said, daddy is thinking about doing a uh, law firm. I need a name. Can you think of a name? I said, you can't, you can't use our surname. You can't use my name. And she was literally just reeling off names and stuff. And she was sort of like, bezel, wezel, nezel, the mezel. And I, I just heard it. I just thought, I said, rewind, what was that? And she was saying, mezel, wezel, mezel. I went, say, what are you saying? She goes, mezel. I said, mezel. And I, whoops, sorry. <laughs> we were, there you go. <laughs> it's all movement based. It's movement based. Sorry, mate. Is it? Okay, okay. For people and, who are just uh, listening on audio, if you're just listening to this, the lights have gone out on Mel in WeWork. That is a standard, <laughs> again, another remote problem, but we're, we're back. Go on. All so, right. Mezzle. So, so yeah, she, she has, 
M-E double Z-L-E, yeah. So she came up with it. And first thing I did, got the laptop out, banged it into Google. And Google, I think I think it's like an error code because it came out, it was like basically zero, 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 zero. And that's like an error code saying, I can't find anything that's called metal. Wow. And that was it. Got that straight away, got the domains, got the dot coms, got the dot UK, dot co dot UK, it's got the dot nets and bits and pieces. So yeah. yeah. That was and it. Then, that was that was that was the name. I changed it with Rogers, as but you reckon. I think also the point behind it was look, we have an exit plan. And I thought when we come to our exit, we don't really want it to be our names, etc. You want to keep it neutral. I think that's the something said to be said about that. And it just yeah, otherwise it was just to sound like any of a traditional law firm. Our trusted partner, Recruit Hub, helps new founders launch their own recruitment businesses in the UK, US, and the UAE. The community is growing rapidly with over 70 founders on the Recruit Hub platform right now. Everything you need to launch your own recruitment business with ease. You receive 100% of the fees you bill. You own full commercial control of your business and increase its value. You get cutting edge tech stack from ATS to sales automation. There's no admin. Handle everything from community registration to contracts to finance and support. There's no setup costs on the platform, no recurring fixed costs, and no surprise fees. If you're thinking of taking the next step in your career and want to discuss your business idea, please book a confidential chat with Recruit Hub team or learn more here. www.recruit-hub.com forward slash UK hyphen awareness. Okay, let's get back to the show. Yeah, look, I mean, me and Amma did the exact same thing and we knew because we worked for a company called Venquist, which we'd already done it. We'd already seen it and we, we sounded like Vanquist Bank that was the only only kind of similarity. Um, is it so an came... Aston Martin? Sounds like when I hear it, that for Vanquist, it sounds like an Aston. Is that an Aston? I'm not a car guy. Is that there's Vanquist. Is that there, there might be a Vanquist, but there's Ven Venquist is is made up. There's no other Vanquist. Oh, so okay. that when you used to put yeah. it in Google, it would be the first one. And yeah. we were like, we spent a year coming up with names of every every one was a made up word, and we stumbled upon Noxo was the one mm. until my brother went into the Urban Dictionary and it came up as a homosexual mammal, and he sent me that. <laughs> And I was like, oh, I'm not homophobic, but I don't think I want that. <laughs> and then, but then it, when we came up with Hoxo, because it was a bit Hoxton and e we're in East London, it just worked. Then uh, when we went out live on LinkedIn with Hoxo Media, and I, I was called yeah. Homo Media in my mate's WhatsApp group. So it ended up being some form of, 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 uh, of jibe anyway. But um, I loved it. As soon as I heard Hoxo, I was like, that's it. And, you know, it's tattooed here and it, it is it's the same as mezzo it's like a word that you put it in google like it is you it's no one else so you the vision what was the vision on day one what were you trying to create we wanted to create and are creating a new lifestyle for lawyers lawyers will probably agree if they're listening to all of this now is that they understand it's burnout lawyers can get to about 45 years old and they get burnt out because the, the demand to get to the office, the billable targets, presenteeism, traveling all the time, it's really, really intense. Clients don't get to see this because clients just probably see, well, my lawyer's 500 pounds an hour, it just sends me crazy bills and I'm having to paint it. Because lawyers sell what's called, Sean, and we, have an, we sell an intangible asset called time. And that's yeah. what we're basically, we're, we're paid against. Um, and we wanted to create an environment for lawyers so that they had the opposite traditional law firms have just existed for nearly like 300 years and that is it so can you imagine a model that just hasn't evolved and you're right everybody needs a lawyer there's only 210,000 lawyers in england and wales and that's got a service 210,000 lawyers now if you say half of those Probably are... a similar amount of recruiters i think there's less than that i think there's about 180,000 yeah. it's not so it's very similar but then if you if you look at any now, now put that metric into how it's serviced so half of those lawyers say that they're the junior lawyers and the senior partners and then everybody else are the, are the ones between sort of seven and sort of 20 years pqe they've got to service the sme market which is about three four million mm -hmm. there's just not enough to go around so can you see how much kind of demand there are on lawyers and it's it's mentally really draining there's a lot of people out there on linkedin a lot of lawyers are posting about um mental well-being it's true it, it really does get down to you but i feel like if i had been in the traditional model i was probably had been close to a mental breakdown 
I, I could have seen it with me. But because I fell into the consultant, I, I completely chanced it. I fluked it falling into the consultant model. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't map it out. It just happened by complete chance. But because I fell into this model, it gave me the three, four times a week to play tennis. I could pick up the kids from school, um, had all crazy holidays. Um, I was earning more than equity partners. It's it's a lifestyle that I've, I'm, I'm really thankful for. So the, the purpose of Mezzel, everything I've learned in this model, I want to portray and get it out to the world and tell them there's a new way of doing law. Lawyers, Sean, are just so risk averse, so risk averse. They're just, they, it's almost like, so they've always described it as, no, it just sounds too good to be true. This model, it just sounds too good to be true. I'm a bit nervous because they've got no comparison. They have no comparison to something else. Imagine being told every day you drive and you're driving a car. It's just a, it's a manual car. Remember clutch, you know, so you, you know, you know, you've got, I'm sure you've got the full driving license with the old way we used to drive. Yeah. I think, I, I think, can you imagine somebody by the way, me? By the way, Amma doesn't, he's only passed in an automatic. <laughs> Don't tell anyone about it. Oh shit, I've just told him. <laughs> <laughs> Loser. <laughs> but that's the point is like, I told my mum, I said, Mum, I said, Mum, stop driving. There's an automatics. And she's like, What? Automatics? Yeah, automatics. And she just wouldn't, she was so afraid to leave because she just knew how to do it. You know, the, you know, the clutch control and knew how to change a gear and what gear to be in. She just, it's just memory, um, muscle memory. And she just knew what to do, etc. So it was just forcing her. And one day, we just, what we did, we got rid of her car. We got rid of my mum's car. And we forced the automatic on her because we knew automatic was the right thing for her. And it just, again, it blew her mind. She just thought crazy. I mean, people told me back then there's going to be automatic cars coming through. I'll be using it all the time. And all of them, no, I don't think I'll Question about it. for you. Question for you, right? So moving, I, I get the reason why the, the pandemic comes, people get a taste and you think, fuck, there's the biggest opportunity ever. That makes complete sense, right? But on the, just to play a bit of devil's advocate, because what's going through my mind is, would the law firms, though, not wise up to the fact that people want that flexibility and provide... They're never going to go to the level that you would go because you're not paying them a salary. So you can't even tell them to go to a fucking office. That's the benefit of it. But surely they could go like, we're now going to give you 50% freedom of working from wherever you want or whatever because we know you did it well in the pandemic. Is that is that like... I, I'm just comparing it again to recruitment. Like the... the a recruitment company that says you're in five days a week now is actually not, it doesn't really exist anymore. That was everyone pre pandemic. Now, mm. if you're a five day a week with no flexibility, like you, I think you're just archaic. There's loads of remote completely, but majority now are like a three and a two or a four and a one or whatever. Like, mm. So no one really has to work five days anymore in an office, but th that is, it's like, it's the in between. I get my salary and I get 50% freedom as opposed to going 100% freedom with no salary. Like, is has that happened in law? Yeah, the, I, think, I think if they're going in half a day a week, fine. That, that's, that's, a, that's a box that's being ticked. Mm -hmm. But the bit that hasn't been addressed yet is that they're still feeling the pressure of the billable times, the targets, etc. And that next bit about, look, my look, people's expenses are increasing. And if they turn around and need a 10, 15 grand pay rise, the law firm partner, the owner, the equity partners are going to be saying to them, well, I need you to work harder. I need you to bill more in order for me to pay you. Whereas in our model, you're right. You can come in five days a week to the office. You can work five days from home. But if you want to earn more money, you just have to probably just do two or three more transactions because you're now taking the lion's share of the income. Bill more. You still have to bill more. Like that's ultimately the, the same an answer. But yeah, the amount you have to bill is less to get the big to get what you need. Well, we'll put, put it put it yeah. So put it into, let's put it into numbers. So I spoke to a lawyer yesterday. Um, she's a really good lawyer. She's got she's got a good solid solid following. She, she's a little bit nervous. She's and I, I, I can see why. Even though she has her own following, she's paid an eighty thousand pound salary. She bills £250,000 a year, okay? Now, she wants to earn more money. Now, her firm, possibly toying around the idea of probably giving her an extra £5,000, I said, if you just pick up, pick yourself up, come over to Mezzle, and just work from home. She's already, she's already working from home, by the way, so she doesn't have to do anything. She just, yeah, I, just yeah. need to re I just need to rebrand her on the website, LinkedIn, the SRA yeah. bits and pieces, 
carries on, she now retains 70% of 250, which equals 175 grand. She basically almost gets a hundred grand pay rise for literally moving from here to here. Yeah, it's and she's just, she goes, like, she goes like, she's my firm could never afford to pay me. I've yeah. had Sean, I've had, I've, had, I've had the, I won't say who, <laughs> I've had the senior partner of a law firm contact me, uh, big firm, big top 100 law firm. And um, as basically said to me, it, it, it was pleasant enough. It was, it was I mean, well, like, we weren't I mean, awkward or difficult, but he turned around and he said to me, he's pretty much the end of his book now. He goes, look, can I say you just don't poach any more of our lawyers and all get them to meet with you and speak to you? Because obviously, you know, they seem to be seeing same mezzle a lot around the office. And I can see that potentially a team's going to come across over to you. And I said, right. And he said, well, and I said, well, I can't stop them. And um, it's I'm making about the individual, but as a firm, obviously you, he's seeing it from a selfish point of view, which I get, I get. And then he ended it by just saying, well, he goes, no, I'm never going to be able to compete with you because I can't pay the salaries that What's you What's in pay. it for you to stop? Okay. He's not going, well, well, in return, I'll give you something. Like, yeah, yeah, no, no. It's, just no, a, no, it's a complete, yeah, that's what, I mean. My, my personal opinion on it was the, the team, one of the guys that was coming over, he was his, in traditional law firms, because they have the balance sheets are heavily capitalized because it's their equity effectively. This partner wanted to retire, but he want the upper the lawyer that was about to join us was a lawyer he wanted to bring into the firm to, to basically pay him off, make him equity yeah. partner and basically buy him out. Yeah, buy him out. And he just thought, if I lose this, this is my opportunity for my retirement. So it was selfish. And I just said to him, that we don't pay salaries here. And he goes, Well, I can't compete with 70%. Well, I said, Well, you're in a different model, I'm in a different model. I said, it's something you you and your partnership should have addressed maybe 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. But Sean, they they won't they, they won't address it because they're too big a beast. I mean, they don't to need change to the culture. I mean, they're still doing well at the end of the day. So how has it gone then? I'm just mindful of time. So you you start you and Raj in the pandemic. You're at 48 people two and a half years later, which is really good going, right? So, and and again, the point of this conversation was, when did you realize you your job became recruit a headhunter? You weren't a lawyer anymore, because it did you it was was the first year or two of Mezzle you did act like a full you were a lawyer, billable lawyer. Like was that? Uh, no, no. I, I I just had a couple of clients because clients are a bit sort of annoyed as they're saying, "Look, I said I can't take any further work on. I'll just finish off your transaction." But for the probably the first sort of six months, yeah. and I'm you know I'm a, I'm a I'm a big biller, and I bought you know it was good good cash flow for the business at the time. Raj doesn't. Raj is obviously just ops. Um, but the, we realised that we had to get uh, lawyers on board, and I know there are recruiters because obviously headhunters were tapping us so when we were at our firms at Gunner Cook and at Shakespeare's and bits and pieces. And Raj has been you know he's always use recruiters to move and then i just realized i just i just had to call call lawyers up no experience at recruitment whatsoever um we we use linkedin i think that you know linkedin recruiter there was just the website all the all the information is there on the website and we just we just got calling we just got calling we realized we also tapped into our network we knew lawyers who were uh, interested um, it was really really hard sean uh getting the probably the first first five lawyers probably first five possibly seven to to convince them keep me imagine sitting there and saying sean um yeah with this new firm got this tech and you turn around to me and go well how many lawyers you got and i had to turn around and say i've got none <laughs> what I mean, what's the first thing that's going through your head when you hear that and you say he's got no, zero I lawyers it. i get it what just i just want to go back on your numbers at the start so three million total G income means that you'll be taking a close to 900 to a million it'd be what the what mezzle makes yeah which across 48 people i'm just doing the maths it's only 62 and a half thousand each so yeah. that's based on some of the numbers you've said that's not particularly they're not going to earn that much money because you're taking 30 percent of you're taking 18 grand off they're only going to make 40 grand doing that or 50 grand is that is that something that every individual okay i guess it's Again, that's an average. There'll be people doing a lot better and worse. But is that something that you're committed to trying to help people make more? Then, or is that is it just because they're so yeah. early on in the in their in their that's career? It, that's it, that's it. Yeah. So, look, so lawyers do what have to do what's called they have to generate whip. So yeah. the first year's figures are always going to be low because there's a standing start. They start from zero, and then they've got to build it up. So yeah. that's why next year it doubles, and yeah. with our projection of uh, four to five years will be up to you know, six seven million. Some of them. You, you can see the trends. We see it on a monthly basis. We, we, we see what they're generating. And I think the bit, the key metric for us is, is, is not the, it's not the invoices of the cash yet. 
it's the number of matters that they're opening. So files are being opened at, the, at a far higher rate than we actually perceived originally part of, the, part of the business plan. So that's why we know just using the average figures will be at 3 million. A year later, we double 6 million. And I mean, sure, to get into lawyer 200, you have to have turnover over 12 million. And I'm, the way it's panning out, Mesel by year five, I actually genuinely feel be before that. I feel be at the middle of 2025, we'll be in the lawyer 200. We'll be turning the, the, mad, the mad thing is, every person you brought in, as long as they get better, you just keep making more from them. Like they just keep yeah, making yeah. you more. Yeah. Like as long as, and, and they keep making more. So it's win. It's completely a win-win. Whereas every other firm, like recruitment at some point the person's thinking why the fuck am i going to be keep paying giving you 70 percent like what they, they they always will if they're good enough yeah. whereas you mitigate them starting the next law firm because they're already taking home so much it would make no sense unless they're yeah. absolutely obsessed with being a team leader manager type person then that your firm won't work for them no um, we're, we're we're really scalable as, as a business as a law yeah. firm and I've, I've also, what I didn't realize, and now I speak to so many more recruiters now, is that um, the recruit market, and I, you know, I, I deal with it a lot now, is quite, it's quite difficult out there. It's very difficult. We are in the partner space, so partners are still being moved around as we speak because they got a good followings, etc. You can make good earnings from in recruitment for partner moves. But um, the point that where we were really different and then recruiters were saying, well, no, how are you speaking to so many lawyers? When we approach lawyers and law firms, we will obviously approach it as a law firm. So they, they sit up, there's like a mutual respect. They, they know that, oh, it's not a salesperson, it's not a recruiter on the end of the phone, it's just pitching me some crap as usual. It's actually, I'm speaking to the CEO of a law firm here and I want to actually listen to this. So we have got, the pipeline for candidates is crazy. I've got so many lawyers knocking on the door. I just can't, I can't get, I can't speak to them um, quick enough. It's just, it's just very difficult. And then that's why we built our internal recruitment team. You know, I've now had to get a CR, CRM. So, you know, we've used quite a few out of there. And I've got, we've just used, everyone says you just use Bullhorn, when Mel, because everyone knows how to use Bullhorn. And it's worked. I've now got a constant flow of influx of lawyers contacting us. I mean, literally got to the point where they emailed me from their work email. They said, we don't care. Just said, can we, can we engineer a way of how to join Mesel as a team or as an individual? So I'm just like, well, wait, wait, so bear with me. Um, and uh, it dawned on me, Sean, at that point, I thought, okay, guys, I know we look like a law firm, we smell like a law firm, we are a law firm, we have to got the SIR registration, but we are actually a, like a headhunting outfit. We we look for the, the right lawyers, the right talent, and we want to we want to make their lives better. Um, we can't tick, we can't tick all the boxes. That's really clear. We'll make it clear to everybody. But we help lawyers practice in a completely different way. And it, it's for various reasons. Somewhat more. And they can come somewhat. in, they can come in as any kind of lawyer. It doesn't matter as long as they're like as long as they're a lawyer. It doesn't as long as they've got their own area. Yeah. It, yeah, would yeah. it dilute we, like if you had let's say you have too many conveyance lawyers, if you the more you bring in, does it dilute the prop the prop the potential yeah, for some you already have? Yeah, really good point, Sean. The we we, we have what's called a 10x system here. 10x is we only have 10 practice areas and we only allow 10 lawyers in each practice area. So we are not heavily weighted on one side. So yeah. most lawyers know that conveyancing is known as the high negligence area. So in, in the property real estate team, we only, we will only ever have 10. And then we want to, and then they want to fill in all the other practice areas. Um, and it, those practice areas are very, we didn't just magically think, well, it's just that area. We realize that those are the most cross referring areas that each lawyer can then say, well, I've got uh, corporate guys in employment and real estate lawyers. So what about, what about like the associate? Again, take this with a pinch of salt. If, if any, I don't want to offend anyone, but like the donkey work bit that the associates run around for the senior lawyers, right? I'm sure they do. Like they do in recruitment firms. We have resources doing a lot of the, the ground, the, the, the grunt work. Like if you look at an executive search firm, you've got an executive search consultant with a resourcer full time working for them, right? Um, do you because do you, is that something that Mesel will provide, or would they have to like attract their own, or like how would that work? So yeah, I get asked, I get asked that all the time by lawyers looking to join us. My answer always is, 
we're not a traditional firm. Okay, there are not going to be loads of juniors running around here. And can I also remind you, you're going to be keeping 70% of the fees you generate. Ultimately, that person could, if they really wanted to hire one for themselves, they could do it, but it's their own. Exactly. Yes, it's it. Billings for them. What, what, what typically happens, Sean, is they realize that I can just do this. Yeah. I don't need a junior to, and because they're, 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 because they're not managing a firm anymore, there's no more meetings, not managing juniors anymore, they actually have more time. And then it just dawns upon them, I, I can do this. Or I, I'll turn around and say, well, if you want me to, I can find you somebody, pay them a salary, or we can reduce it 70%. I'm not going to reduce it 70%, but it's the mindset. I just I have to you, explain to them. How do you manage each, like the people? Like, what's the kind of angle that you go down to manage and make sure that there is some form of structure and... It's not just a complete chaos environment. I mean, you're dealing with lawyers, not recruiters, so it's probably a little bit more, <laughs> or a bit more grown up. But well, we don't we don't manage their practice. They operate because that's why the lawyers are over ten years PQE. They're all they're ex part. They're all partner level lawyers. So we don't manage their for them technically. That's their. That's, they know what they're doing. Um, but compliance and finance, we are always checking in it all the time. I have a compliance team. I have an admin team. We have a finance team. They're constantly talking to the lawyers we have a whatsapp community we don't emails emails i say to the lawyers are for you and the client but everybody else speaks to everybody on whatsapp it's faster it's quicker we are you know our technology platform mesel cloud we built it ourselves we don't use a traditional type of platform so we spent nearly we spent six figures and i don't mean just 100 grand we spent six figures eye watering amount building the tech that we have that so we were just we were just well, we are. Everyone tells everyone tells me, sorry, that we're five, six years ahead of every other law firm on its technology basis. And the bit that's that's good comparing us to the entire wider market, but comparing us to the fee share market to our competitors, there had to be something that we stood out, Sean, that we had to be completely different. Because everyone's gonna say, Well, Mel, you're like everybody else, you do 70, 30. Okay, your tech's better. You, you pay the consultants the next day. That, that's really good. It's not like paid at the end of the month. Um, you do offer higher fee shares if we bill more. All right, great. Tick, tick, tick. And you're part of the WeWork network and you can navigate mm -hmm. around the world and have offices where you wish. But the thing that the bit that was so different and we are, I mean, I, I, this is this is where Raj comes in. So I want to I want to launch it. I want to launch it yesterday. I want to do it straight away. But Raj just reins me in back every time. He goes, Mel, it's a great idea. If we're going to do it, we're going to do it. I promise you. So we agreed now we're going to launch it in June 2024. So about Q3 next year. It's a program called Dial Nine, the Dial Nine Initiative, and Dial Nine is the program that we've built, and it's and sure it's really good. It's really similar to the Hoxo Academy, because when I went on your course, you know, I loved it. It taught me a lot and it gave me more inspiration for Dial 9. So Dial 9 is our program where we help lawyers, fee share lawyers who want to come across um, and we, we train them up to win more clients. So we don't, there's no law involved. It's going back to my, my years of the, my early years of as a consultant lawyer. Everything I learned about how to train a lawyer, how to increase their profitability, how to increase revenue, how to win client work, et cetera. LinkedIn training, okay? All of that will be part of our program to teach them. It's like a two-year commitment to then boost their earnings. None of our competitors does it. We're the only firm that provides a program. And so, it's all about them. Final question is, what's the end game? Because time-wise, we're, we're running out of time. But this is, I could speak to you about this all day. What's the end game, Mel? What are you trying to create here? Because you've just said you could be in the top 200, did you say, law firms? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Totally. What are you trying to do? Yeah. Like, you, Again, I've met you. You've got an amazing, you've got a portfolio of business we haven't even spoke about. Like, You do a load of work in property development. You're building blocks of flats and all sorts of stuff. So this is actually one of a portfolio of things you're up to. You, you think a million miles an hour. You move a million miles an hour. But what, you, what is the end game for Mezzle? We want to be the biggest fee share law firm UK. So that includes Scotland, obviously England, Wales. We're about to launch in Dublin as well. Okay. And we already established in the Middle East and Dubai. Um, I could either answer it by saying we want to have a thousand lawyers, or I could say that the, the target number of revenue is 75 million, but it, it, it could happen. One could happen before the other. Um, How would you do a thousand lawyers with a 10x model? Have you 
Well, no, it, 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 would, it, would, it would be possible. I, I get that. The, the 10x model is to get us to the 100 and then assess the business at right. that point. Yeah, yeah. You can't yet. It, it, yeah, it can't. You can, I, can't I could go around and tell you what, 2,000 lawyers, but you've yeah, got yeah, to have yeah. a sense. You've got to have a sensible milestone. And, and that's what our yeah, 10x is. Much. Yeah. And, and, and the point is, once you've got the 10x covered, you can then attract every other sector of law. So you can get yeah. the pensions, lawyers, etc. So that's why that's the, that's the, uh, that's the, the that's why we have that design. But for us, I want to get I want to get a little unknown law firm that was set up in the pandemic because of the pandemic because it's completely new restructure new redesign I want to get it into the lawyer 50 top 50 and then there is an exit of course an exit because look I, my, my children my, my wife everything to me and I want to I, I've got I've got two girls and a son and I'm living, I'm living the life of my son always through his eyes a, li a little bit shouldn't be but I wanted to be a tennis pro so I'd like to give him that. Uh, I know. I, want, I didn't get it. Mel, Mel Richard Williams gang here. <laughs> I want to get him. I want to get him in the local tour. car park with a with a with a <laughs> trolley. Trolley of tennis. Trolley. Balls. Tennis. Yeah. <laughs> Done it. I'm already there. I'm already there with him. I've already, already bought his tennis kit. He's sleeping in his oh, tennis kit at night time. time. And um, you got all this to come, Sean. In know, a couple of weeks. Two weeks. Two weeks. Two weeks. It's um, one of them. I, I don't know if I'm having a boy or a girl, right? And and one of the things that. Um, Obviously, I'm a, I'm a crazy football fan, Man City fan, always have been. My stepson is a big, he loves his football. He's, he's a Sheffield United slash Man City fan now. And, uh, I, I, you know, in, I, don't, I don't, honestly don't care if I have a boy or a girl. I've got no preference. But if it is a boy in my head, you've got the future football and all that, right? Yeah. But then one of my mates who's got a boy and a girl, his girl plays for Sheffield United and goes to the season ticket with him and she's obsessed with it. And his boy is, is into drama, doesn't have any doesn't have any interest in football. So like in the modern game with with, with women's football being so big now, like I actually think well, it, it, you don't know, like you don't know what they're going to be interested in. And there's so much opportunity for, for, for sport for both genders. Um, will I be as pushy as you? Don't know. Probably not. Probably not. <laughs> sure. I don't, sure? so. I, don't, I don't think so. I'm not. I'm not as wired that way. I don't think. Um, but when would you see yourself as an exit, and then genuinely stop working, or would it be then a new? There'd be another business idea. Yeah, probably. I can't. I can't stop working. I mean, the plan is to probably we'll, we'll exit probably when I'm going to be about fifty-five. I think I'm still quite young. Uh, we already had private equity knock on our doors. We're too. We, it, we, yeah, but too, but too, but too. It's too early, and mm. it's nice. It's nice having that. It's given me a huge positive, real boost. Um, I love, I love law. I love law firms. I think law firms. You know, they need to. There's only a few publicly trading law firms, and there should be more. Um, it's it's a tough industry. It's not easy. Nothing's ever easy. Um, I just think law can be better, and I think traditional firms, Sean. Uh, Laying into a little secret here, they I really don't want traditional law firms to go ever, ever, because I don't see traditional law firms as our competitors. No. I actually see them as our suppliers. Yeah, they yeah. supply. They said they supply. They train everyone else to come to you. Yeah, of course, of course, yes. of course Mel, it is. we'll leave it on that note, um, mate. You're an absolute legend. Um, I've got no doubt about this, but there'll be other recruitment owners listening who want to talk to you and want to pick your brains because they'll all be imagining how they're going to copy your model and blah blah blah. But um. Are you open to a chat if people do reach out and they want to put your brains on stuff? Oh, definitely. Look, we're, we're growing the internal headhunting team here now. Um, and we are getting approached not just by lawyers, but by recruiters. So um, we're speaking and we need to build our team here internally. So, of course. Yeah. I'm thinking the other owners, though, uh, they've got no interest in, in working for you. They're just going to want to pick your brains. So, if, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, good networking for sure. Bye. Guys. Anyone listening, I hope you've enjoyed it. I, I mean, I thought this was an incredible episode. Mel, you're an absolute star. We're going to get you back on in at least in about 12 months' time. That's my plan, to see where you are on this journey. 48 today. Let's see where we are in a year. Um, you take care of yourself, mate. Appreciate every minute. And uh, I know how busy you are, so thanks so much. Thank you, as always, for listening to today's show. I truly hope that you got value from it. Honestly, it's the only reason I take time every week to ensure that my audience, you guys, future and existing recruitment owners, you're learning from each other to make this industry that I love so much stronger. And today's episode is brought to you by my business, Hoxo. I'm the CEO and founder, and we're on a mission to help brand recruitment agencies and their people better. I wanna help people have the tools to stand out in the most competitive markets in the world. 
We're currently working with over 350 recruitment agencies and 5,000 of their consultants right now, helping them to build their personal brands, to consistently win more business, attract talent, and just become that go-to recruiter in the market. Now we do have a huge coaching program, but a lot of people don't know, we also manage the brands of a lot of founders and we can do the rebrand of that company organizational piece as well. So if your recruitment agency either needs help to look and sound exactly how you want it to, or your leadership and consultant level need to get out there and drive more traffic back to that website, to the business and start using LinkedIn to generate more revenue, then you should definitely be reaching out to us. If that sounds of interest, please do visit www.hoxomedia.com or drop me, Sean, a personal message on LinkedIn. I love hearing from RAG listeners. I would love to talk to you. Uh, look forward to it. So I'll see you again next week with another episode. Catch you soon.